past few weeks, very little legislative work is happening. It seems, uh, again, that the majority party members aren't on the same page when it comes to the budget, and they're still not allowing the minority party a seat at the table during these negotiations. So today, we're providing an update about this 2022 legislative session with Senator uh, from LD29, Martin Quesada. Uh, Senator Quesada is a Democratic member of, and I, I just took this right from Wikipedia, <laughs> Martin, of the State Senate serving since 2015. He's also a member of the Pendergast Elementary School District Governing Board, where uh, he and I first met at an ASBA function, and he's been serving there since 2011. He was previously a member of the Arizona House of Representatives from 2013 to 2015. He's also an attorney in private practice and has served his community in a number of different roles. He previously served as a research analyst and policy advisor to the Arizona State House Democratic Caucus. And currently he is running for uh, the 2022 election for state treasurer of Arizona. Though, since we are a 501c3 organization, we don't do any endorsements. He's here strictly to kind of give us an update about what's happening at the legislature this session. So welcome, Martine. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me here. Good. Um, so real quick, did I, is there anything that I missed in your um, introduction? Is there anything that I should that I left out that I shouldn't have? Uh, no, I mean, I think, I think you covered all of it. <laughs> yeah, I wear a lot of hats, so uh, thanks for covering it all. And you are actually running, or now, are you up for election again in Pendergast, or was that in I am. Yes, oh, you are. So okay. I am campaigning for the school board as well. Okay. So uh, it's a lot of campaign work. No kidding, yeah. Um, so real quick, let's just start off. I'd like for you, because I share this with our members, and again, members, or people who are on this call, this webinar right now, if you do have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat and we'll uh, pass them off to Senator Quesada. But if you could maybe just give a description of your experience in this 2022 legislative session and how this session compares to all sessions that you've been in prior. Yeah, good question. You know, and and just for some background, I've this is the uh, tenth, or actually the eleventh um, session that I've been a part of um, as a legislator. So I've been here for the last decade uh, doing this, and I can say that if I had to pick just a couple words to describe this one, 2022, uh, it has been the most frustrating, uh, the most emotionally draining, uh, and the most um, radicalized uh, that I've that I've ever seen. Um, the, the, the members are definitely a radical group of people, and they are pushing a very extremist and radicalized agenda at the state capitol. And so it's creating a very emotionally draining uh, work workplace. Um, there's not a lot of good stuff being done there, uh, and, uh, there's, and there's a lot of fighting back against really, really bad stuff. And so it has, it has definitely been a draining experience. Um, and in a lot of ways, I'm, I'm almost glad that I'm termed out of the Senate and moving on to other things. It, it's gotten that bad. Well, and that's such a shame too, because you and so many other members of your party are, you know, just so spectacular in your thoughtful dialogue, whether it's at the dais in a committee hearing or on the floor. And so it's disheartening for me to hear that. Um, and I sure hope that maybe in 2022, the folks that come after you can feel like they have more of a voice. Um, you know, you talked about the radical extremism happening at the Capitol. So what would you say is like the most maybe glaring example of extremism? And I know there's probably, there were how many thousands of bills introduced? Um, what, what do you think is the most radical um, thing that's happened at the Capitol this legislative session? Ooh, uh, uh, this legislative session, I mean, the one that comes to mind right now, just because it's been in the news, obviously, with um, the leaked draft from the Supreme Court is, is the 15-week abortion ban that we modeled, um, you know, after, the, after that Georgia law. And so uh, that one has been, uh, uh, you know, one of the most difficult that we've passed. And, and it was passed knowing that it's unconstitutional as it stands right now. Uh, it probably won't be unconstitutional after this court releases its opinion, but they passed it knowing uh, that um, that it was it was still um, a violation uh, of the Constitution. And so, uh, seeing how um, issues like that 
they've really just not considered, there, there's no consideration to constitutionality. There's no consideration to right and wrong. It is all about pushing an agenda. And so uh, that is one uh, with that abortion ban um, that really took control of take, taking full control of women's bodies um, and not giving women, you know, the, the or anybody who's pregnant really uh, the ability to make that decision about their own body. And so that is the most, that's the most recent one. Um, but aside from that, I mean, everything that's happened with elections, um, everything that's happened with criminal justice reform. I was just speaking with um, a friend of mine this morning about uh, a bill that that really criminalized, um, uh, further criminalized immigration status. Um, and so uh, there, there's been elements of every single controversial issue. Uh, all of those have been touched upon this year. Now, the immigration one, I believe, if, if I'm not mistaken, that one is HB 2696. Yes. <laughs> and I heard you speak about that one, um, both in committee and on the floor. And um, could you just maybe explain that to folks who may not know what that bill would do? Right. So th this was a, a, a larger bill. Um, it did a couple of different things. But uh, number one is it uh, increased dramatically uh, the criminal penalties on uh, people who commit sex offenses, um, you know, so and, and, and by tripling the amount of time that they spend uh, behind bars, that's problematic in and of itself because longer sentences don't work. Uh, it just makes it look like we are being tough on crime and we're being tough on the worst offenders. And I think we can all agree, you know, people that commit sex offenses um, uh, are, are, you know, they, they, they're some bad people and they, they deserve to go away, but uh, lengthening their criminal sentence, the time, of, uh, the time that they spend behind bars actually doesn't make us any safer once they do come out. Um, and if anything, uh, it makes us less safe uh, when they come out because they're not getting really the, the treatment and the services that they need uh, in order to, you know, to, to be able to control um, you know, th those, those urges that they have. And so, uh, we, so that was the first thing that this bill did. In addition to that, uh, it, it really modeled some of the Senate Bill 1070 language uh, in regards to the transportation of of immigrants. So if you're providing transport uh, to an immigrant, it criminalized that act. Um, that was the, originally in Senate Bill 1070, uh, and, and that was removed after Senate Bill 1070 was challenged uh, in court. Uh, that was part of the settlement negotiation is that that part of the law never actually went into effect because it was unconstitutional. They tried to put that back into this law, into this bill um, uh, again. They did remove some of that at the end, but there still is um, a part of that bill now that has now been signed into law by the governor. He just signed it the other day. There still is a part that can be interpreted to have the same effect as that element of Senate Bill 1070, basically criminalizing, giving transport uh, to a, a person who is undocumented. And that is like, so, and I, I you know, I, you gave an example of what if, what if I needed to give, you know, my my elderly uncle uh, a ride to that, whether I whether whether I know his his documentation status or not, but he needs a ride to to get his treatment at Mayo Clinic or to pick up prescriptions at CVS. Now, if if, if somebody knowingly or unknowingly gives that person a ride somewhere, not realizing or you know maybe they knew that they about their status, they now are facing felony charges. Is that correct? Right. Right, right. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it, and you're absolutely, that's a great example of what would happen. Um, you know, giving uh, uh, somebody a ride to a doctor's office, giving some a ride to a pharmacy, uh, giving, a, a, you know, a people a ride to school. Um, uh, those types of things would now be criminal offenses. Uh, and so it, it's a really scary um, uh, law that was just passed. Yeah, that, um, you know, there's, again, it... It's, it seems to me, and this is what I've been saying week after week, that the cruelty is the point. You know, at the same time with this 1164 abortion ban, the 15-week ban, we've got uh, SB 1399, which I believe the governor also signed into law, that would limit prospective adoptive and foster parents from adopting from religious adoption and foster agencies that are getting state money, by the way, taxpayer money, and they can reject somebody based on their religion. And, and what we're seeing now, especially with this leaked um, opinion, is that, you know, this, this row, the overturning of Roe and the reasoning given by Justice Alito could really 
overturn a lot of our laws, including gay marriage. And so that could mean that these adoption agencies could say, oh, we don't we don't adopt to two dads because it's against our religion. Is that right? Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I think a, a lot of those things, um, uh, gay marriage, those types of adoption issues, uh, a lot of those are really at risk now once this opinion does come out. We don't know how far and how wide ranging this opinion is going to be and what type of impact it's going to have uh, on, on all of our lives, really. So uh, this is a really scary time for us. And I think that it's something that, um, you know, that, that Senate Bill 1399 that you gave is a perfect example. Um, it's something that really serves no purpose. I mean, uh, kids that need families and people that want to adopt them, uh, you know, it, 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 it just makes no sense to, to put that into law. No, and again, as you know, the the hypocrisy to me is glaring because they say that they care about preborn, right? And they say they care about life. However, they 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 want to micromanage who is giving birth. They want to force people to give birth. You know, in a in, in a in a country where you know you can't even drive a car when you're twelve or thirteen. Well, if you've been you know molested by an uncle and, and end up pregnant, you're old enough to have that kid. You're not old enough to adopt a kid, but you're we'll force you to have that kid. It's just right. it doesn't make any sense. Um, so you know, I watched you frequently <laughs> this legislative session, uh, and it's is it government and elections committee? Is that the one or yeah? where we saw countless, can you, can you give us even, I, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but what's your estimated guess on how many bills made it through that committee that are related to voter attacking our voting freedoms? Yeah, there, there was a lot. Um, it was really every, literally every agenda. Um, there was at least a handful of elections bills uh, that were being put through the process. A lot of them, and I would say, you know, anywhere from five to 10, every committee hearing, um, elections bills that we were in, sometimes more. Um, so that's a that's a that's dozens upon dozens of elections bills, and they even pushed through issues that they knew didn't even have full Republican support. Uh, but they were that that committee was used as a platform and as a soapbox to really spew a lot of just rhetoric that and completely false rhetoric about um, about our elections and 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 the legitimacy of our elections. Uh, so there was a lot of really bad stuff that went through that committee this year. And one thing that I noticed attending those committee hearings was the number of, oh, what do they call themselves, um, uh, independent journalists or influencers. A lot of these folks, it was very interesting for the first time to see so many people who subscribe to this big lie and who, you know, the Stop the Steal movement. So many of them talked about being at um, the Coliseum during the fraud at count and all that kind of stuff. And, I, you know, in your experience, and, and I don't know how many years you've sat on that committee, but I would imagine that that you've been there for a, a while, a few years. Have you ever seen that kind of, you know, um, extremist QAnon kind of stop the steal conspiracies? No. And, and I can tell you, I've been dealing with elections issues on, on whatever committee dealt with elections issues for my entire legislative career. Um, so for the last, you know, the last 10 years I've been, I've been doing this. Uh, and so I've always been placed on those committees. And yeah, the, the, the lie that was created, that big lie that was created, like you mentioned, um, after the, the 2020 election, uh, they have only stoked that lie further and further. Uh, and people have bought into it. And that's, I think, the saddest part is that there were so many people who, uh, believe that with all of their heart and their soul that this election was stolen from Donald Trump, um, uh, and and we're seeing and they all came out this year. I've never seen anything like that ever before uh, in my whole legislative career, and it's really scary because people are dug into those beliefs. Uh, they refuse to consider uh, uh, anything that's real, anything that's counter to that, any evidence uh, of 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 how that is a lie uh, and, and they just refuse to even acknowledge it. It's like they've created a new reality and they are choosing to live in that reality regardless of what it does to anybody around them. Uh, and so it, it is a truly scary situation and 
as elected officials, I think I said this in one of the committees myself, but you know, as elected officials, we have a responsibility uh, to, to spread the truth and to even tell people what, what they don't want to hear sometimes. And, and this is an issue where I, I believe, especially Republican members had uh, really a responsibility to, to tell the truth uh, to the voters and, and let them know that you know, we've done the investigations, we've done the audits, even that fraud it. Uh, that fraud it showed no no uh, you know no wrongdoing either, um, and and the election was simply not stolen. Like you guys can stop doing this, but instead they're doing the opposite, and they're continuing to stoke these fears, and they're continuing to campaign on lies, uh, and and I think that puts our democracy in a really bad place. Yeah. So, and and I think most of our members know this too. You know, it's a sixteen fourteen. Uh, balance in the Senate. It's a 31-29 balance in the House. Um, just explain to you, for, I think most of our members are really savvy about this kind of stuff, but that one seat in the House and the Senate, you know, what does that exclude members of your party from? Yeah, no, no, great question. Because I, you know, a lot, a lot of times I just assume that everybody kind of knows that dynamic. But um, there are 30 senators in the Senate. And in order for any bill to be passed, you need uh, 16 votes. Uh, and right now the split, like you said, is 16 Republicans and 14 Democrats. So they, so what essentially what that creates is uh, a, 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 a dynamic where they simply don't need to even engage with Democrats. Uh, even talk with us, even negotiate with us, even compromise with us at all, as long as they have 16 solid Republican votes. They don't always have that. Um, and so a lot of bills, rather than rather than uh, mm -hmm. negotiate with us, rather than a dialogue with us, rather than try to create bipartisanship with us, a lot of issues, just they just let them die. Uh, rather than try to come up with a better solution that involves our party. But if they've got their 16 votes, uh, that's all they need. And, it, and the same dynamic is occurring in the House, where it's a 31-29 uh, split. You need 31 votes to pass a bill in the House. They have 31 Republicans. Uh, so with those numbers, they literally don't need us. Uh, and they could choose to work with us to create better policy, to hear our ideas, uh, and to incorporate some of those ideas, at least steal the good ones, you know. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but instead, they choose to exclude us from everything, literally everything. Um, and the, a perfect example of that is what's happening right now with the budget negotiations. Um, those, the, the, the state budget and the $5.3 billion uh, budget surplus that we have right now is being negotiated only amongst Republicans. Uh, and they haven't included uh, us, the Democratic leadership at all in the Senate. And so uh, we expect that a, a budget proposal will come out that only serves Republican interests. Uh, and so that that creates just bad policy all around. And it's not a good way to govern. And, and I think that, you know, if it were me, if I was on that majority side, uh, I would want to hear the ideas that they have, if for nothing else, to steal the good ones, you know, and incorporate those good ones. And they don't even want to do that. So, you know, I wonder to, you know, given your tenure now at the Capitol, um, and knowing knowing that what less than one percent of the bills that are even heard during most legislative sessions even are authored by a Democrat. I know a lot of Democrats personally who end up trying to get things co-sponsored, and there are small victories. You know, I know that I believe it was uh, Senator Alston who was able to put forward a bill that um, would increase the stipend for kinship care for foster kids. That's great, from like seventy five dollars to three hundred dollars which is huge, still not enough probably, but fantastic. Or, you know, I think Senator Christine Marsh had a bill that was about fentanyl. Um, so they do creep through, but I'm curious about you. Uh, do, do you continue to try to put forward bills or do you just kind of feel like it's like beating your head against a wall? And, and if you had the, a chance to put forward bills this legislative session, what other things might we be talking about instead of the big lie? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And, and, you know, every legislator kind of takes a different approach to, to how they do that, especially as Democrats, when we know we don't have the majority, we know that most of our bills aren't going to get heard. Uh, some legislators don't, don't introduce any bills at all. Um, I take the exact opposite approach. Uh, I introduce bills on every single subject. And I believe this year, I, I introduced about 100 bills. 
um, on everything from criminal justice to healthcare to to housing to uh, to rent control to uh, environment to water. I mean, to everything, every issue I tried to introduce a bill on, uh, and and the reason for that, my strategy for that is is to put out there that there is. Um, another uh, another perspective. There are other ideas. There are different ways that we could be doing things. Uh, that gives me the opportunity to speak um, on every issue because I can say I introduced a bill on that. And here's, here's a better way that we could have approached whatever that problem is. It also gives me an opportunity to uh, to put those ideas out there so that they can be stolen by the other side. Um, and I know like for me this year, I had one bill that that did get signed by the governor um, it, it, and a Republican member stole it from me. Uh, he took that issue, ran with it and it became law and it's a great bill. I was happy about it. Mm -hmm. um, but um, had I not introduced it originally, uh, he, may not, he may not have ever even thought to introduce that bill. Um, and so uh, that, that's my approach is to introduce as many bills as I can. Um, if we had the opportunity to get those heard, we could be talking about a lot of really good things. Um, paid family medical leave. We could be talking about automatic voter registration. We could be talking about rent control. Uh, all of this housing issues that, that, we're, that we're seeing right now. We could be talking about stipends for, for the price of gasoline, you know, giving, giving some refunds for, for the price of gas. We could be talking about all sorts of those things that would actually help people right now, real criminal justice reform issues, um, you know, same day voter registration, all of these different issues um, real water, uh, dealing with the water crisis that we have right now. And this is going to become an even bigger crisis uh, in these next few years. Um, uh, we're in a really bad place with water right now. We could be addressing that if democratic ideas were given a hearing and if we were given the opportunity uh, to put those ideas forward. Um, so I believe that uh, you know Democrats that get elected next year, um, wink, wink, <laughs> uh, need to continue uh, introducing those ideas and, and showing the, the state of Arizona that there are great democratic ideas out there that could become law if uh, the right pressure is applied and the right um, accountability measures are applied to our elected officials. Well, and I, I appreciate that sentiment too, you know, you just remove ego from it and, you know, it doesn't really matter whose idea it is, as long as, it, you know, that idea at least gets a, a place to, to be heard and to be debated and to be voted on. So I, I definitely appreciate you for doing that. Um, you know, you mentioned water. I'm I'm curious, what are, what do you think, I mean, because I, I lose sleep over water, you know, there was just a report, I think it was a partnership with NPR, like KJAZ and somebody else, they had a whole discussion about water. And we're talking like months uh, to a year of us looking at like rolling blackouts and things like that. Um, you know, uh, are there any bills coming from the other side that are addressing the crisis that we face with water? So interestingly, um, the governor has an idea on water that he has put forward uh, and it is getting opposition. It, it is such a bad idea that it is getting opposition both from Democrats and Republicans right now. Um, and so he's trying to create a whole new water. It's, he's calling it the Arizona Water Authority. It's basically a, another entity that can buy water rights. Um, uh, and so it, it's, it, and he's put a lot of, he has proposed putting a lot of power into this entity, um, and and it would it basically seems like it would be doing the bidding of his uh, uh, his special interests uh, in regards to water. So it is such a bad idea, uh, and it is such an important issue that even the Republican caucus is opposed to it right now. And and I know that the governor is still pushing hard for that to 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 move through this year. He wants that to happen this session, um, but I, I I up to this point. I haven't seen it make much progress, and I'm hoping that we, as a as a, a legislature, but regardless of party, that this is one where we can stick together and say we don't want to focus on these bad ideas. We need to focus on some good ideas about how to preserve water, how to save our water, and how to protect us, um, uh, protect the people of Arizona who desperately need that water. Um, the solution that has been pro proposed so far is not it. Um, but the governor is pushing really hard to get this done. And the fact that all of this is being done behind closed doors should be a major red flag to the people of Arizona. This hasn't been getting front page news because it, it's a big negotiation behind closed doors. 
uh, and not all of the parties are at the table with this negotiation. Our tribal uh, nations aren't even at the table uh, with this. And we know that that water is a huge issue for them. They need to be part of this negotiation as well. And right now they're not. So um, stuff is happening regarding water, but it's not good stuff right now. And I'm hoping that that we can use this uh, time to become bipartisan and work together to, to at least propose some uh, uh, minor um, water solutions uh, for us for the future. Well, and, and you brought up something too that, um, you know, like I, I feel like there's been so many times when I've gone to the Capitol and the one that sticks out right now, and I don't remember if you're on this committee or not, um, but it was about uh, some one of the many firearms bills, right? Because this session too, currently in Arizona, I feel like firearms have more rights than pregnant people, <laughs> you know, or trans people. They're prioritizing the rights of a firearm over the rights of actual human beings. But in that, um, you know, discussion, it, you know, we, we, it was the one about um, firearms on college campuses and they brought in the police chief of ASU, you know, and he's the expert on this is bad. This is really bad. It's going to be bad for us. It's going to be bad for the students. It's going to be bad for the faculty. Or, you know, there, there was another bill debated in the House Education Committee. And, you know, one of the members said, so what education groups did you consult with? Well, you know, they consulted the, the author of the bill consulted with a, a privatization organization or, you know, like a charter school voucher kind of organization. So, but not the actual experts, not ASBA, not ASA, not AEA, um, not AFT. So like, it's very frustrating when you have experts who are willing to show up. And in some cases, because they limit the number of speakers, those experts don't even get to speak. Um, and, and so that was, I think, more of me just having a soapbox moment because, because I really want to talk about, you said something else too, um, about consulting with the tribes. And, and because I invited you here to talk about, um, about uh, the voting, uh, the constitutionality of some of these voting bills, um, how will this, I think it maybe was 2492, the one that um, do see, and I, I, and I can look it up and see if I got that right, but that's like the overarching uh, voting, uh, you know, attack on our voting freedom bill that he signed into law. And I remember listening to Senators Hatakli and Gonzalez talk about how this would disproportionately affect people living on our tribal reservations. Cause, so can you talk a little bit about that bill and um, how it disproportionately affects people on those reservations. Yeah, definitely. And, and that was, it was 2492. And basically uh, what that bill did is it, it would require proof of citizenship uh, on voter registration forms and, and, and voter registration verification. Uh, it would require like the proof of location of residence uh, to, and, and, and it would require, um, it would provide uh, like steps that a county recorder must take in order to uh, verify the citizenship of a voter. And then it would actually criminalize a county recorder for not rejecting a voter registration form uh, that didn't have those extra citizenship requirements. This has already been challenged in court and it has already been struck down by the court, already been found unconstitutional. So like they already know that that the 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 this is against the law that it is it violates the constitution uh, but they're doing it anyway and and that just really goes to show and so you know senator hatakli uh, uh was was really great about this she got up and, and told how this would impact uh, Native American voters. A lot of them don't have those forms of ID. Uh, and, you know, just because of the, the nature of life um, you know, on the reservation, a lot of them never have a need for that ID and, and don't even have the records that are needed to require um, those IDs. And so uh, it, it makes it almost an impossibility for them to ever be able to, to uh, provide the proof that is needed in order to register to, to vote. Um, and and that, that's a shame because they, they deserve to vote just as just as much as anybody else does. Uh, does. And so uh, this would absolutely infringe upon uh, Native American rights uh, uh, as much as it would impact Latino voters, as much as it would impact el elderly voters, uh, some younger voters as well. A lot of voters would be impacted by this, but specifically those voters of color. Uh, and and, and when they, when, when, whenever 
we as a legislature bring up those issues and talk about the disproportionate impacts on communities of color, they shut down the conversation right away. They refuse to even talk about it. Uh, and, and my point about that is, if you refuse to even uh, one, consult with those communities of color, uh, mm -hmm. and two, talk about those issues, uh, that just proves that, that you, you, one, you don't care about the impact, and two, that it's by design, that you're, you're intending uh, to cause that impact because you don't want us to talk about it. You don't want it to become public what that impact to those communities of color it, uh, are. So uh, these, these bills are designed uh, to suppress uh, some voters more than others. Uh, and unfortunately, those are uh, predominantly uh, voters of color. Uh, and this House Bill 2492 is a perfect example of that. Um, and we had very pointed discussions both in the Rules Committee uh, and on the floor about that impact on our, on our uh, Native American communities. Uh, and they moved forward anyway. And so again, that, that just proves that this is all by design. It's a strategic effort. It is a surgical ep effort uh, to intentionally target those voters. Well, and, and the narrative is so simplistic too, you know, well, just go get that ID or, you know, what's, why is that such a big deal? And, and it's just, you know, such glaring blind spots of people who probably have never even visited the reservations and really have no idea, you know, not just about the, the obstacles that people may face when it comes to voting, but what, what, what things people have to go through just to get water on the right. reservation, you know, so there is an, and it, and it goes for our title one schools too. I, I remember going to the Capitol when I was still in the classroom and inviting uh, legislators come, come do home visits with me, come, come visit my classroom, come see the ceilings that are falling down around my students ears and do a home visit with me where you will actually think for a moment that you might be in a third world country because the level of poverty is unlike what most middle-class Americans have never seen before. Right. Um, none of them ever, well, I mean, you actually have taken me up on my offer before. I know Senator Tehran has come and visited my classroom before. So there are some who do that, but the ones who really need to, they just continue to be really tone deaf about these things. And it's almost like a willful ignorance, you know, out of sight, out of mind. It's not my problem. As long as my corner of the universe is taken care of, well, that's all that matters. And that kind of seems to be the vibe at the Capitol. Yeah. Um, so do you think that we are going to see uh, court challenges to some of these? Uh, well, I believe there's already been a, a lawsuit filed against 2492. Right. Uh, do you think that will, uh, what do you think is going to happen with that? Yeah, no, I think absolutely. Um, uh, there's a, a number of these bills uh, face potential lawsuits, and some are, are already facing lawsuits, and for good reason. I mean, a lot of these have uh, blatant and obvious disproportionate impacts on uh, on voters of color, and so uh, I think that it's it's the, only the the natural next step is to challenge these in court. Um, I I think that a lot of this is is a a, a strategic move on their part as well. Um, they've been stacking, they stacked the Arizona Supreme Court, uh, they stacked the United States Supreme Court, uh, and so they're hoping that they're going to get favorable rulings, um, regardless of what precedent actually tells us uh, that these rulings should be. So they're hoping to overturn a lot of these laws, just like we just, we're, we are probably going to overturn Roe versus Wade uh, in the next couple of months, whenever that uh, opinion is officially released. So I think that's the strategy that they've been uh, putting in place for the last decade that I've been there. They've been preparing for this. Um, and, and that is the way that they hold on to power. They know that, um, you know, they know that the, the demographics are changing. They know that the politics are changing here in Arizona, but by uh, uh, putting our, stacking our courts in this way and having these legal rulings in this way, um, that's gonna preserve their power uh, for longer than it should be preserved. Uh, given uh, the, the makeup of our community. So it is a very strategic move on their part, but uh, it doesn't mean we shouldn't fight back. And I am sure that a lot of these lawsuits will be will continue to be followed through. And I think a lot of them are gonna be successful at least at the lower levels. Um, and I'm hoping that you know a court would have some, some conscious and, and uphold them at the higher levels as well. Yeah, same. Um, all right, so real quick, I just want to put it out there for our members. If you do have any questions, I'll give it a going once, uh, going twice. And in the meantime, I'll ask a final question, unless something else comes up in the chat. So um, people, 
there's a kind of collective anxiety, I feel like, not just here in Arizona, but kind of throughout the United States. Um, each headline every single day gets a little bit crazier. You know, we've got all this stuff that's happening in Ukraine. Um, we've got uh, all these attacks on our voter freedoms. We're looking at Roe going away where, you know, somebody like me, I've only known that, you know, people will have access to abortion, that my daughter's actually going to have fewer rights than I had. So with, with the anxiety, frustration, fear that people are feeling on, on all of these different fronts, um, what would be your advice for somebody who wants to try to, you know, improve what's happening in their, in their community and their, in their state and in their country? Yeah, you know, I, I think, I mean, obviously the, an, the answer is simple and that's like, you got to participate, you got to vote. Um, but I, I really think that what, what this is showing us this last couple of years is how important those, uh, those races are at the lower end of the ballot. Um, you know, our, our school board races are critically important this year. Um, our local city council races, our, our legislative races, this is where most of those uh, most of those rights that are impacted, most of those values that we care about, that is where uh, they are addressed the most, is at those local levels. Uh, and I know that everyone pays attention to the big races, uh, the statewide races, the, the, the congressional races, uh, the U.S. Senate races, but those legislative races really have uh, a major impact on your life. Uh, and, and right now, I think especially too, the art, we're going to see a lot of changes at that school board level as well. So my advice and my 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 request uh, to people would be to definitely pay attention to that, to the lower ends of those ballots. Uh, get to know who your school board members are. There's going to be a lot of really radicalized uh, candidates for those offices uh, coming through right now. And if they do get elected, we're already seeing some of it happen in some school districts, but um, the, the impact that it's going to have on our kids is really going to be devastating. Yeah. And, you know, we actually, uh, what was it, two weeks ago, I think we had the Chandler Unified uh, School District. Uh, we had a candidate forum and I encourage you to uh, find it on our YouTube page or Facebook. Uh, I believe it's on the 25th of this month. We will be having a candidate forum with the uh, Peoria Unified School District um, because we are, that's where we're seeing Christian, white Christian nationalism play out in real time where people are, you know, um, being, uh, you know, harassed or assaulted, their cars are being keyed, things like that. So we want to make sure that our members and anybody who wants to sign up to our live events can see who the candidates are, because it's not always easy to know a lot about those candidates. People don't typically give a lot of money to those candidates, so it does take more and more money. And the radical extremists are being funded by some of these astroturf groups. So it's really, really important um, in those nonpartisan races to know. And now we actually do have a couple of questions. So uh, the first question is, do most or many lawmakers truly believe the conspiracy theories, the big lie, et cetera, or are they simply playing to the base? Are they as divorced from reality as they come across or are they cynical? Uh, you know, I, I, think, I think a handful of them do believe it. Um, and, and that just shows kind of how how extreme they are as individuals. But I would say, honestly, the overwhelming majority of them, they, they know that this is a lie. Um, this isn't about, uh, and it is about catering to a base. Uh, this isn't about um, uh, you know fixing our elections. Uh, this is about winning uh, for them. And this is about, they know that this is the way that they win elections is by suppressing the vote. And they, they justify suppressing the vote by promoting this big lie. And so uh, they, they have an agenda and it is uh, their whole effort is to justify that agenda that they're trying to enact now. And so I've heard um, many Republicans say quietly, yeah, we know this is a bunch of nonsense, but uh, we're going to do it anyway, you know. And so um, aside from like the county board of supervisors, uh, I, I think a, a lot of them are just afraid of that base that they've now energized um, and they've they've awoken a monster and they don't know how to how to control it anymore. Yeah, I agree with that. And then we have one more question here. Uh, my question is, how strong is the constitutional basis of Roe v. Wade? Uh, you know, I think um, in, in Arizona, I think we have uh, an interesting opportunity here, uh, which is why I'm really excited about uh, you know, candidates like, like Julie Gunnigal and, and, and Chris Mays for Attorney General. Uh, I think those are gonna be critically important um, offices. Um, but I, I, the Arizona Constitution has a very uh, specific um, right to privacy. Um, and, and that's different than the, the United States Constitution. And so I, I believe that that privacy right here in Arizona is actually stronger 
than the one uh, in our federal constitution. So I think that there's an opportunity there for us to really challenge um, uh, that a, a woman's right to, to make that decision for, for herself uh, under that um, right of privacy. Um, and so I think that, you know, uh, depending on who our, our, our new county attorney and our attorney general is, will really determine if we make that legal challenge and test out the limits of that uh, right to privacy in the Arizona constitution, because it hasn't really been tested um, in our courts uh, uh, to, to that extent yet. Um, but it, it is there uh, and it is very clearly worded. And I think that there is a very strong argument uh, that, that the, the right to choose um, should be protected under the Arizona constitution. Right, well, I think that's, I think that at least leaves us on kind of a, a bit of a high note. Oh wait, here we go. <laughs> One more question, I guess. Um, some people running for school boards are, uh, are campaigning on being against critical race theory. Is critical race theory or its ideas being taught in K-12 schools? No, absolutely not. Uh, there's no, critical race theory is a legal um, uh, philosophy. I, I studied it in law school. Um, and so uh, it, it, has, it has no application to uh, to K-12 schools. What they're, what they're using, they're calling things that are, they're calling critical race theory, things like uh, equity uh, and, and, and just accurate teaching of history. They're calling that critical race theory because it sounds good. Uh, it sounds good to them, but it, it literally has nothing to do with critical race theory whatsoever. Yeah. And again, I, you know, it's one of those things, if children are old enough to experience racism, I think that every other child should be able to learn about it. Um, because and many of our children experience racism on a regular basis. And I think that if more people had a deeper understanding of things like the Tulsa massacre or you know the various other things that have happened in our nation's history, I think maybe we would all be focused on doing better. So um, good question. And again, I, I, I'm grateful to you for taking time out of your very busy schedule. I'm always grateful for your voice. You're gonna be sorely missed uh, next legislative session. Um, but I look forward to seeing uh, what else you do. Um, as far as for our members, don't miss uh, Chrissy Stroop, who's going to be speaking at, on Christian nationalism. Uh, Lindsay put it in the chat. That's May 31st at 6 p.m. She's one of my favorite people to follow on Twitter, and she's going to make a fantastic um, guest. Like I said, the Peoria Unified School District uh, debate, or not debate, but candidate forum is happening on the 25th of this month and we're continuing to bring out more programming for our members. So thank you, Senator, for joining us today. Thank you, Jenny, for having me. All right, and thanks everybody else. Y'all have a great day. Bye-bye.